Yes, recording now. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Um, and also, please, um, we're, uh, I think we can, given that it will be a relatively small group, uh, we would be happy to have a discussion um, at the end of this session. Um, but feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, we'll we'll go through our demonstration first, and then um, hopefully have time. And we'll, I'm, I'm certain that we'll have time to share, but and discuss, but um, also to to introduce ourselves properly um, towards the end of the session. So um, with that in mind, let me just, I will um, uh, give a very brief introduction to uh, SDSN and to the, uh, the SDG Transformation Center, just two slides, um, since I know that you're mostly interested in, in um, uh, looking at the data and how to extract it from our, uh, our uh, data repository. Um, but uh, by way of background, uh, SDSN, for those who don't know, is uh, a global network launched in 2012 uh, to support the implementation of the SDGs. We operate under a mandate from uh, the UN Secretary General, um, and we're directed by Jeffrey Sachs, an economist um, based in New York City. Um, our, we have offices in New York, uh, Paris, and Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And um, the SDSN consists of a few different offices or different, we have different um, um, uh, goals. Uh, some of what we do is about SDG policy analysis and support. And so that's what Guillermo and I work on is um, uh, research uh, into new indicators, new data sources, new ways of uh, making sure that uh, the uh, data and analytics that we produce are used towards better policymaking. So we help um, governments, we help UN institutions um, and uh, other other bodies to reinforce the, the science policy interface uh, and to ensure that um, policies towards achieving the SDGs are measurable um, and 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 actually and attainable. Um, we're also a global network of knowledge institutions. So there's um, over 1,500 universities and research institutions throughout the world that are linked to SDSN as members. So uh, we we share best practices, share the latest research on um, on all of the SDGs. But um, some of our our affiliate networks are uh, are specialized in, in certain areas, um, which we invite you to to um, to learn more about on our on our website. And finally, we have a an online education component um, that. That's to introduce SDSN at the SDG Transformation Center um, is a is the think tank piece of the of the puzzle of SDSN, um, and we work on uh, producing uh, data and analytics, including geospatial data and analytics, uh, which Guillermo will be presenting. Um, and we present this work through a number of indices, uh, the SDG Index, the Sustainable Development Report. Um, we also work on international spillovers. Um, but also increasingly on financing, the financing gap for SDGs at the country level, um, uh, tracking SDG policies, so the extent to which governments are um, actually engaged in, in achieving the SDGs, and also uh, looking at um, SDG implementation locally throughout the world. So with that um, very brief introduction out of the way, uh, I invite you to look at our, our website, um, the SDG Transformation Center, and also to follow us on LinkedIn if you haven't. Uh, I'll share links in the chat. Um, but I will now uh, leave it to Guilherme to um, to kick us off with our the topic of our session, which is about the uh, Rural Access Index, uh, and he will uh, take care from here. Thanks, Guilherme. Great, thank you, Eamon. Um, so hi, hi everybody, and happy GIS Day to everyone. Um, so I'm I'm Guilherme Abdomalski. I am uh, the SDG Transformation Center um, geospatial data specialist or geospatial data scientist, as uh, as one would wish. Um, and my my job essentially revolves around uh, calculating and providing uh, data sets for particular SDG uh, indicators. So let me share my screen, and we'll get right. Uh, into it. Here, here you go. So um, I wanted to take um, a moment to talk about the Rural Access Index, but also about um, other uh, other work we've been doing in terms of uh, geospatial SDG indicators, and, um, and I'll get to why that's um, relevant. So first of all, we have we are funded by um, Esri, so we have a bunch of our tools that are using uh, ArcGIS um, tools, and um, and if you go to our website, you'll notice that uh, uh, our flagship report, the the SDR, is um, 
always uh, available as a PDF, but also always as a map where you can filter by um, SDG indicator or by SDG goal uh, altogether. So all of that is currently being developed uh, with um, ArcGIS uh, for JavaScript. And we also have a number of um, uh, story maps that are done with um, uh, uh, with ArcGIS online. So uh, a, a lot of what we do is based on um, these tools. Um, but uh, uh, the, the main focus of uh, what we have, we've been doing is uh, creating uh, geospatial data sets for STG indicators. And, and that's where we might uh, have uh, more than one uh, way to look at this. So you are you probably are aware of how uh, things are um, done at the global uh, UN, the hardcore UN um, um, uh, ecosystem where everything has to be uh, either country-led or country-owned. So essentially much of the, the statistics that are being put out uh, currently by uh, UN stats is highly dependent on countries being able, so governments being able to uh, run those methodologies and deploy uh, those data sets themselves. We have the, the, we are fortunate not to depend on that ourselves. So the STR is um, running on data that is sometimes uh, uh, calculated globally and not country by country. And for geospatial, this makes uh, especially a, a lot of sense because as we know, a lot of the data that we use in geospatial is coming from satellite imagery, which is collected uh, very often at a global scale. So we can run those calculations at global extent and we can inform on uh, those indicators uh, across the entire globe at whichever scale in very um, um, uh, comparable, uh, uh, we make everything comparable by calculating all at once. So we have been deploying for, so for the, our latest uh, report, which was uh, released uh, last uh, June, we, um, we have two new indicators that um, um, inform on SDG indicators related to accessibility. So the first one is related to the 15-minute city. So we have run um, some Python scripts to, to calculate um, uh, accessibility for pedestrians at uh, all, all main um, 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 large metropolises and, and also uh, medium uh, sized cities in the entire globe. So we have used OpenStreetMap uh, data for that and also um, 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 open sourced Python packages for those calculations. And more recently, uh, we also did uh, the work that I'll be showing uh, today, which is the Rural Access Index, which is not uh, um, a very difficult one to outline, but it's it's certainly a difficult one to um, to calculate. It, it, it means a challenge. I think I have someone at my door. If you guys just excuse me for two seconds, I'll pick up uh, while while Guillermo is uh, addressing his uh, his urgent issue. Um, the and he'll probably speak about this more. But the the methodology that we're using for the Rural Access Index um, was developed by a team at the World Bank. Um, perhaps you've, oh, yeah, you're back. <laughs> I'm back, sorry. I'll, I'll let you pick it up. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so essentially there's, there's good reason to run these calculations because sometimes they have never been done at a global scale following the most recent methodologies. But there's also a, a case for providing these calculations and deploy those methods to provide the data at um, a more granulate level. So being able to provide not only country level data, but also uh, province, county, municipality level data, which uh, informs so much of what is what many, many cities are trying to do, which is producing uh, voluntary local reviews, uh, which are also based on the SDGs, but need data that is relevant for those uh, uh, very localized um, locations. Um, 
So, so just to just to, to to comment on the tools we're using. So, in in many of these cases, we are using Python, uh, a lot of Google Earth Engine as well, and OpenStreetMap plays a, a big role also in providing data that you can exploit at um, global scale. Um, so all of that is being made available through our website. We have an online library for the reports where those data sets are being uh, integrated, but we also have um, um, a portal for the data we are producing. So you will find on our uh, ArcGIS hub, you will find the data for uh, in, in format of a spreadsheet for you know the, the all of the indicators that are being used in the in the report, but you'll also find in its uh, original format, so in its geospatial format, the indicators that we are producing uh, with geospatial data. So you'll find uh, uh, those two uh, indicators that I showed, and also some uh, other ones. Um, and just to mention, we are also partnering with the UN uh, GGIM, which is the UN um, Secretariat for uh, um, for geospatial data in, in all things uh, geospatial, to in order to sort of break that barrier of uh, not being able to use uh, geospatial data at global scale for many of the reports because of how things are set up. So we're trying to break that barrier uh, at uh, the uh, larger um, UN ecosystem. Uh, and so why is that uh, relevant is uh, we know that uh, we are making some progress. We know that we are not making uh, progress in many areas, but there's there's a, a, a rather large data gap for many of the indicators. If you take our, our latest uh, report, you'll find that for the indicators we do have access to, uh, we have we haven't really been making good progress since the pandemic started. For some other ones like infrastructure, it has been actually uh, um, uh, going upwards. But there's there's a lot for for which we don't really have enough data to know. And many of those uh, critical data gaps can be filled by uh, geospatial data. There's a, a lot that exists and in, it's currently not being leveraged into uh, indicators for many reasons. And I'll cover uh, the reasons why uh, that was the case for the rural access uh, index. Um, this slide is essentially to say, uh, this is all of this is useful because it provides better temporal and better spatial uh, resolutions that can uh, then be used in very disaggregate uh, uh, scales for uh, countries and uh, states and municipalities and etc. Uh, so, as I as I just said, uh, those those two accessibility related indicators are part of the latest uh, SDR. Um, so we did uh, on SDG eleven the access to uh, relevant services uh, for pedestrian in um, uh, for in, in urban areas. And then for rural areas, we did for SDG 9, which is energy innovation and infrastructure, uh, we measured populations access to um, all season roads. So what's the story uh, behind the rural access index? It's, it's actually rather a, a sort of like a fruit salad of methodologies. A lot has happened. So in 2006, uh, the World Bank created essentially the the idea for an indicator that would measure um, the uh, access that rural populations would have to roads and not any road, so a road that provides uh, access all throughout the year. Um, and that created a lot of questions. So what is an all-season road? How do we delineate what that means? Um, and of that first iteration in 2006 uh, was actually trying to measure poverty. So it was a proxy for, for poverty. And it was being measured um, through surveys, household surveys. So the responses were not really comparable. So different uh, cultures, different locations would classify their, their roads they were using to get home as all season as providing all season access or not. And, and that provided a lot of variation. It was hard to get a, a glimpse of what's the situation for uh, the entire globe. 
So it took 10 years for the World Bank to um, provide a new uh, um, enhanced methodology, which they call measuring rural access using new technologies. And those technologies were actually GIS. So, so that's the point when the World Bank uh, uh, says, okay, we can't do surveys anymore. We need to use uh, geospatial data, and then we can actually start uh, comparing uh, different locations. Otherwise, this doesn't really mean much. Uh, and so that happened. And uh, some, so th there have been some um, isolate uh, applications of that method since, but no global implementation. Um, and all of those implementations had uh, slight changes, so like slight differences uh, differentiating them from one another, so making it hard to really create that comparison. Um, and so in 2019, the World Bank um, um, endorsed uh, and not commissioned uh, a, a new supplemental guideline provided by TRL, which is um, which used to be a, a, a company uh, from the UK, and um, which provided uh, some some additional insight, uh, especially on what makes a road uh, all season. And, and so they took uh, the expertise from a lot of um, road engineers saying, what are the, the main risk factors that make a road uh, impassable at some point uh, throughout uh, the year? So that is the, that 2019 methodology is the, is the latest one that was endorsed by the World Bank and the World Bank is the custodian. So they have essentially the power to say, this is the, the latest and this is, this is valid uh, and the UN uh, will endorse my endorsement. Um, and so that has been sitting there in their uh, website. And, and, and if, you, if you access the World Bank uh, data catalog, you, you'll find that all of those methodologies and some data sets for some uh, specific countries uh, done following that, but you won't find any global data set. Um, and that is that used to be entirely possible to, to just uh, do. And so that's what we did. So we took that uh, latest methodology and we applied it at a um, global scale at, a, at the most granular level uh, we could get to. So you will find some global data sets like the one that is current, currently uh, hosted on SDGs today, which comes from the uh, NASA CDAC. And you also find um, one that is mentioned by this uh, TRL uh, report, uh, which was done by a company called uh, Azavea, but none of them actually follow the latest methodology. And I'll get why that is critical because it really changes a, a, a lot of how you uh, uh, understand uh, all season access. So this is um, um, a, a little diagram for us to understand what we're talking about when we talk about uh, access. So in the definition, uh, the World Bank stated that the, the RAI, RAI, Rural Access Index, is the proportion of the rural population who lives within two kilometers of an all season road. So in theory, it's, it's actually pretty simple, right? So you just need to take all, all roads um, and all, all, all season roads and then create a buffer, uh, a two kilometer buffer uh, on, on both sides and see how much of the rural populations of any given place falls within that buffer. So in theory, it's really simple, but um, that actually raises a bunch of um, questions. So what do we consider to be rural and what to consider to be urban? Uh, which roads can you consider to be all to provide all season access? Uh, and considering that there's no timely database that contains information uh, on all seasonness, how do we uh, get close to that? What proxies do we, do we use to get close to um, all season access? So um, all of those global data sets that I just mentioned uh, did something that is actually uh, pretty simple. They just equated uh, all season access uh, to mean uh, road surface. So if a road is paved, it's considered to be to provide all season access. And if it's unpaved, then it doesn't. Um, and so, the, that's the, that's the, the whole point of this uh, latest methodology is saying 
actually in many rural uh, uh, spaces, um, non-paved um, roads will provide all season access. There's there's nothing intrinsically wrong with uh, an unpaved road. It, it it can provide all season access. So it's so all of those data sets were really providing uh, uh, understated uh, or uh, under um, assessed. Uh, numbers for that access. So we're getting like 30% uh, population having access to all season roads in countries like Colombia, which just didn't make um, a lot of sense. Um, so that's the the, the challenge uh, we took on to define what is rural, what is all season and how we uh, get at least close to that. So this is um, uh, uh, a diagram of the approach we took with all of the uh, processes and all of the data sources that uh, we use. So I'll cover this in bits. So the first thing, the first question was, uh, what is rural and what is urban? Uh, so if you were at the um, uh, presentation from yesterday, from SDGs Today, they did a a GIS Day event as well. They are also part of STSN. They were talking about the the Gerba uh, methodology that um, was created by um, um, uh, GHSL, uh, who are um, uh, um, a part of the European Commission, uh, which is essentially a new method for outlining urban areas and and by by extension saying well what is rural uh, um, in contrast. So we also, we use that, that is the, the current uh, best um, 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 data we have on urban uh, data, but we also use uh, a previous and actually better uh, delineated data set that NASA uh, put out a few years back. So we took uh, those two and filter for um, urban. So. We took both of these at a global level and, and, and from that we derived the urban land cover, which is going to be subtracted from everything we're going to do uh, 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 following on. Um, the second thing is um, trying to find a, a good data set to make sure we have all of the roads uh, mapped. Um, so we so for that, we took three different uh, data sets that we put together. So the first one comes from GlowBio. They have a, a, a data set called GRIP a Road Network, which actually is taking data from uh, authorities. So, so national governments are providing uh, data sets to GlowBio and they put all of them together under the same uh, data schema which is great because many of those data sets actually have um, a field for saying, does this provide all season access or not? And the issue with that is that its uh, coverage is just not great. So many countries are not uh, currently able to uh, provide a good, um, um, a good vision of what's the current uh, road uh, coverage. And this was the case for, you know, uh, uh, developing countries, but also from for, for some developed countries where you just uh, the, the the official data was just not a quick uh, updated at a, a quickly enough to follow a new roads that were built uh, uh, year after year. So for that, we also needed uh, something that would provide that timeliness to this data set. And that's why we use the Bing uh, road network data set. And that provides the best timeliness because that is uh, being the roads are being extracted from satellite imagery through uh, neural networks automatically. So that doesn't depend on people digit so a, a human being digitizing uh, a road from from plans or from imagery. So that is being released by Microsoft uh, yearly. Um, so. From that, we, we we can be sure that we have the full extent of roads, but that data set doesn't come with any uh, attributes at all. So we ju it's just a road and nothing else. So we are uh, obligated to consider all of these roads as being unpaved. We don't we don't want we, we are not sure 
what's the pavement there? So we just assume the worst case scenario for the roads that exist exclusively on the Bing data set. And then uh, to make the bridge between those two, we are also using OpenStreetMap, which has for, you know, the, the to, for starters, the hierarchy from which we can uh, learn uh, a few things. And in some cases, it, it also has the, the uh, um, pavement uh, information. So we took all of that together and then we created two different uh, sub subsets from these data sets. So from all of, for all of the roads we consider to be paved, we created a buffer a two-kilometer buffer uh, around these roads. And for all of the roads we consider to be unpaved, we did a separate buffer. So now we uh, we have two subsets, one for paved, one for unpaved. And um, and then we have the buffers around these um, two subsets. So for the first one, uh, where we consider roads to be paved, then we are going to consider all populations that are rural uh, that fall within that road buffer have access to an all season road and and that's perfectly fine so everyone has been considering if you have access to a paved road then you have access to an all season road then you can just uh, um, run a clip operation unpaved roads are going to be more complicated because we know that some of them won't be able to provide all season roads because we'll be finding uh, potholes or they, they're going to be flooded at some point of the year. And some of them will be perfectly fine. Actually, it's completely fine to use an unpaved road to access uh, your home. So for um, trying to understand which of these unpaved roads provide or not uh, uh, all season access, we are going to create a passability index. So the passability index uh, is actually um, um, being proposed from the 2019 methodology, where they say, uh, where those uh, road engineers are, say, are telling us what is really critical for a road to, uh, to be kept and to be kept passable is that, uh, is the amount of rain it, that road is going to be receiving and the type of uh, terrain where that road is uh, located. So a very, uh, a terrain where the slope is very high and where it rains a lot, that road has a worse chances of providing uh, access all throughout uh, the year. And and we are and we are completely on board with that. Except when we run we ran the first time the, those calculations, we realized that a very different places on Earth would 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 be uh, presenting very similar. Uh, um, um, amalgamations of those uh, variables. So we noticed that uh, in Scandinavia, so Sweden and Norway, we had um, some very slopey terrains and a lot of rain. It's one of the places where it rains the most on planet Earth. And that would be very, very similar to um, places near the, the Congo Basin. So uh, uh, Sudan, for instance, were presenting very similar um, results to that. And so we, we realized we needed to add, actually add an extra indicator on that would tell us um, uh, what's, how, how are those roads being kept? Is, are those unpaved roads receiving any maintenance at all and by how much? And uh, that ind indicator exists, which is the um, uh, proportion of the GDP that is, uh, spend, that is spended on uh, road maintenance but that is not available all throughout all countries. So we needed to also use a proxy for that. And so we used uh, GDP per capita to get closer to that um, uh, maintenance status uh, of roads. So uh, we take that passability index that is calculated from those three sources, and then we can just multiply that population that uh, lies within the unpaved road buffer uh, and that will essentially tell us um, uh, if how much of that population we believe is going to have access to an all-season road. So uh, that passability index is going to vary from zero to one. So if all of this is really intense, 
if the GDP is low, if uh, it rains a lot and terrains are really sloppy, then this will be close to zero. And so we'll, we'll multiply that population at pixel level. Uh, mind you that all of this is taking place in terms of uh, raster algebra. So all of those calculations take place at the pixel level. Um, and so if this is close to zero, I just multiply that population within that pixel by zero. And, and so I assume that 0% of people living there have access to an L season road. But if all of this looks good and it'll be closer to one, and then I can multiply all of that by one and all of them are considered to have access. And so we put those two uh, um, uh, clipped population uh, rasters together, and then we get to the rural access index by dividing by the entire country's uh, population, rural population. So this is sort of the 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 large the larger picture of what we did, and of course, uh, population is coming from WorldPop which provides the better uh, resolution uh, currently for population across uh, the globe. Um, so how does that possibility index uh, work? So we are not, we're not doing the same as other methodologies did, did in the past where we, in some of the, in those cases, unpaved rows were just removed altogether from the network. We are applying those uh, uh, that possibility index to the unpaved uh, road uh, network. So what it, what that is doing really is um, keeping the population in proportion to the likability of that road being all season or not. Um, so this is what I was just saying. So we're doing that pixel uh, level through raster algebra and population is kept at 100% if all of this looks good and, uh, and to 0% if it doesn't. So this is a little matrix of um, uh, what the first iteration looks like. So for the terrain, we are taking the, the minimum values up to the maximum values. So this is a very slopey terrain and this is a very um, uh, um, um, plain terrain. And here in climate, you have this, uh, um, sorry, this is the, on the contrary. This is a very slopey terrain and this is not, and this is a lot of rain and this is a uh, rather dry uh, climate. So if those two conditions meet, so slopey and rain, then the, the index will be close to 0 0.06. And if uh, good conditions meet, then it's closer to 0 0.95. And if they're perfect, then it's uh, one. Um, and then, as I as I, I just said, uh, Norway was presenting uh, pretty similar results to South Sudan, and so we had to add that uh, third indicator for the passability index. And this is what uh, it looks uh, uh, when combined. So if I have and this minimum then becomes uh, very rainy, very slopey, and this maximum becomes uh, very dry and uh, plain terrain. And then we um, also add GDP per capita here. So uh, a very low GDP and uh, uh, bad uh, conditions uh, for terrain will result in 0 0.03. And if you if you get to the maximum here, and this was normalized, um, then you'll get a one. So for whichever case, if you are at the maximum GDP, whichever terrain and climate conditions will be reverted back to a hundred percent. So this is this comes from the the idea that if a country has a really really high uh, per capita GDP, it doesn't really matter what conditions a road is exposed to because uh, we have we have confidence that those roads are being uh, kept uh, with good uh, maintenance. Um, all right, so that Should was we, sort yeah, of- Before we, before yeah. we move on, um, I think we have 20 minutes left. Um, th there was a question, is it okay if we address it now well, um, before going right. into the demonstration? Yeah. Let's do um, it. Okay, so the, there was a question um, from one of our, our colleagues present. Uh, about the, um, how do you distinguish between the rural population and different regions? Um, are there 
uh, differences in the, the way that rural population is calculated in Asia versus Africa, for example? Can you can you just mm -hmm. explain a little bit how that um, how it's how it's harmonized or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so you'll find all of that explained at the GHS uh, ZMOD uh, at the European Commission website. They have used, uh, of course, satellite imagery, but um, and 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 also you know um, uh, samples from local uh, local experts in telling what is and what isn't. But essentially, it's um, it's a a, a trade-off between the number of people in a pixel and the density of uh, occupation in, in those regions. So it's a, it's a, a threshold of uh, quantity and density that is um, um, essentially telling you if, if that's urban or if it isn't. And in this, in this picture, you can see um, those, um, 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 those blobs here of uh, gray areas. Those are uh, urban areas. But this is what actually what the um, uh, Grump data set looks like. So Grump, uh, that is run by NASA, with a very similar um, 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 proposition, they provide those as um, a vector. So it's it's much better delineated. And I, I feel like they, they actually had someone look at uh, pixels and then create clusters of these pixels. Uh, whilst a GHS smart is provided raw at pixel level. So in some cases, and uh, you, you might have you know some some noise in the data because those conditions are met or they are not met. And that is especially um, um, that is a problem, especially in uh, northern India, where you have a very sparse but very uh, close together uh, uh, populations. So, that that region is the one that will vary the most uh, uh, between those two data sets and considering them to be rural or not because they're really close together it's a lot of people but it's still still very much looking like a rural uh, um, area so that is a, a it's one of those um, decisions you need to to make uh and so we we went with uh, ghs as mod for that but uh yeah population and density Thanks. Um, so all of that was uh, calculated uh, in the cloud through uh, Google Earth Engine. So uh, luckily, most of those data sources are already available uh, freely on uh, Earth Engine. And so we don't have to actually run the process uh, at once and, and create like this really gigantic raster uh, for the entire planet at this very small uh, pixel size. So that can be done uh, iteratively and uh, statistics are um, in turn uh, created uh, when we extract the zonal statistics by uh, country. But this is what the raw data uh, looks like on Earth Engine. So you see here uh, the buffer uh, for the roads and you see in yellow the, the po populations that are uh, within those buffers. Uh, in gray, you see urban areas, of course, and in red, you see populations that uh, fall uh, outside of the uh, all season road um, buffer. So all of those points in red are people living uh, outside of the two kilometer uh, buffer. Uh, so this code is made uh, publicly available and it can be used to create uh, statistics. But that is, you know, there's there's a, 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 a knowledge barrier there to run things in that platform. Uh, so we make things available um, uh, at country level on our uh, own uh, website. So you'll find, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, you'll find uh, visualizations and the, the, co the complete methodology is also made uh, available on the website. And um, and you will find some more um, uh, scientific checks of that uh, approach. So we we did uh, two checks. So we checked for construct validity. So that is that we did by comparing our results to other similar but still different methodologies for the same thing. So the the Pearson coefficients, the correlation coefficients for that were pretty high. So we are not far from them, but we are not identical to them. And we also checked for convergent validity. So 
comparing our data set to others that we expect would uh, vary accordingly. So we did that for GDP per capita and also for HDI and got um, uh, pretty decent results. So we know they are not identical, um, but they are somewhat uh, related. So we are uh, pretty happy with that. So I want to take uh, the time we have left to just show you how you can access uh, that data. So if you go to the STGTC uh, website, um, here we go. You, you will find a whole lot here. You can find our, our reports and our work on financing policies and also on spillovers. Um, but we have a, a tab specifically for our geospatial data and tools. So if you go to um, the about our geospatial tools, you'll find uh, some explanations of what we are currently working on and what uh, is available. So you can download data from these produce indicators and you can also explore uh, methodologies for some of them and also some uh, maps. So if you click this explore button here, you'll, you'll get to see this um, uh, very simple map that is hosted on ArcGIS online, where you can check results for uh, each country dynamically. Uh, you can also check the methodology. So this is a PDF uh, explaining all of what I just uh, showed. And you can also um, download. So if you go to uh, the download button, you will be taken uh, to our um, ArcGIS Hub uh, website. So this is where we keep all of the, um, the data we produce. And, um, and in here, we'll be able to uh, not only get, for instance, uh, a shapefile. So you should click. So here you have the metadata for this. So you have the, all of the explanations of, of how this was done, from which sources. You can um, use the, the API, so ArcGIS API for creating apps with this and, and whatnot. But you can also just plain click uh, download here and get this in whichever format you want. So you can get this as CSV, a shapefile, a GeoJSON. Uh, you can do as, as, as you wish with this. I had thought I would have the time to show uh, how to make a dashboard uh, out of this, but I don't think I have enough time. So I will maybe just show you what I did uh, prior to our meeting this morning. So you can find uh, this data uh, publicly published on ArcGIS Online. So if you go to uh, ArcGISOnline.com and you create an account, I think you can still create a uh, uh, a free account these days. You can just go to uh, content, and if you search the the entire um, 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 catalog from ArcGIS Online users, you will find the rural access index um, uh, available for for use there. This has also been published to the ArcGIS Living Atlas, which is uh, Esri's. Um, um, catalog for curated data sets. So if you look for rural access index here, you'll, you'll find it listed right here. So you can also access it uh, through here. But, um, but what's, uh, what's fun uh, and what I'm going to show is that you, you have um, um, a map here, which is also made uh, available. So this is the feature layer that is being used by this uh, map, which you can also access because um, it's all publicly uh, available. You can create um, a web app with this. So if I want to create, for instance, uh, a dashboard with this, I can just open, uh, I'll just say this is GIS day number two because I did one uh, this morning with the same name and um, and then I can create some some pretty simple but really effective uh, visualizations uh, with this map. So it'll load the map that it already has uh, a particular symbology uh, to it. Then I can just you know go on and add some elements uh, to go with it. So I think since we are measuring things from zero percent to one hundred percent, gauge is interesting. So for the gauge, I just need to select uh, a layer which is of course the only one 
we have there. And we, I want to show uh, a single feature uh, by uh, Rai. So, so here you go. You can you can see it like this. It um, can also add uh, colors to this. So from up to 50% is going to be a rather um, uh, bad um, um, score. Up to 75 should be an okay score. So I'll just make this uh, yellow. And up to 100 uh, is going to be a, a, an excellent score. So I'll just make this um, green. And I can also add um, a title to this. And so the title should be just the, the country name. Here we go. And I'll also mention that this is the rural access index for that country. I'll just centralize this and make this um, a little bigger. So here you go. And now I have a really big god here on my right. And I just need to create uh, an interaction between uh, those two. So if I go to my map uh, and layer actions, I can um, I can add a filter action to that goes to my gauge. So whenever I click uh, a country here on my map, um, I need to go here actually. Um, it's going to be under. No, actually this is not needed. I just need to also make this work on, here we go, select feature. There you go. So whenever I select a country here, I see the, the little gauge on the right uh, also change. I can also add different stuff. Like um, if I add a single uh, a bar chart here using the same layer, uh, but I'll this time I'll group by um, continent, and I'll be showing uh, the statistic uh, statistics of Rye, but I also need that to be average by by continent. And there you go. Yeah, Larry, we have a question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, at what at what scales did we aggregate the results? Only at the country scale, or at the county and province or city scale as well? Right. So so. At at our currently in our ArcGIS hub, you'll find this only at um, country, so at national scale. But you have uh, a full access to the Earth Engine scripts where you can run these um, uh, zonal statistics for whatever um, um, polygon you provide. Uh, but there we go. I just wanted to show you that this is all available on ArcGIS Online and that you can do whatever you know ArcGIS Online provides uh, in terms of uh, apps and maps. So um, this is also true for our different data sets and for those other ones, we do have statistics by uh, city uh, and even intra-municipal uh, scale. Uh, if I what's the name of the story map? I think it's accessibility indicators for the SDGs. So here you can see some maps that we put together for the urban accessibility uh, indicator where we uh, did that for every city um, in, in the planet uh, using you know, similar data sets, but different, um, uh, different methods. Here we go. So, so Lagos is uh, rendering here where you have accessibility at the intra-municipal level. So this is these are points that look like a raster, but that's that's actually vectors. Uh, so all of all of that is also available, but this is outside of the rural uh, realm. Um, but we 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 are thinking of making the rural access index uh, available also at different scales. Um, uh, should, shouldn't there be any interest uh, in that? We have just a few minutes left. Um, I, I think if there are any other questions, um, I, please please feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, we will be providing our, our contact information um, so that you can reach out to us individually or after the presentation um, to follow up on specific questions about the data 
about the methodology um, or about our uh, how we're using this work. Um, so as as you've as you've seen, I mean, it's um, this this is a uh, an excellent example of the transformation centers um, and Guillermo specifically his work on on uh, indicators for uh, using geospatial data. But we're also exploring how these can be applied uh, to policymaking. Uh, also, how how cities and local subnational governments are are uh, making use of geospatial data at their level, <clears throat> um, given the specificities of of the local context, um, and also trying to publicize and make uh, you know, people more aware of the of the usefulness, uh, the timeliness, and the global scope uh, of, of these indicators and of this data um, for measuring the SDGs globally. Um, so on that, we have just a few minutes left. Um, once again, thank you. Um, uh, I see that someone asked or says data on cities, the local level would be great. Um, yes, I think that's, that's a, we've heard that um, in, in uh, other contexts. And I think, again, you can, um, uh, within the, the data that's provided online, you're, you can uh, filter it uh, to, to fit your needs, but I think that we can explore uh, producing a, um, a more accessible um, uh, format that's focused on cities, um, not for the RIE, but um, for some of the other data. Um, and um, on, on that, I think uh, we have just two minutes left. Um, we, the, S, the SD Transformation Center and SDSN will be hosting uh, um, events like this once a quarter, basically. So um, we invite you to, if you found this useful, to uh, to join us once again um, early in early 2024. Uh, we'll be exploring some of the other work that we've been doing um, uh, using geospatial data and uh, and some of our Esri tools. And hopefully next time we'll be able to involve um, some of our other um, colleagues, uh, either at Esri and or at UN UN organizations. Um, to to compare and contrast how this uh, to the data is being used, and also to see some some practical use cases um, of the of its application. So um, on that, Guillermo, do you have any any uh, word of conclusion? No, th thank you everyone who who showed up. Uh, I'm looking forward for those those next ones, and uh, don't hesitate to drop me a line if you have any questions or if you just want to chat. So thank you very much. Once again, this meeting has been recorded, so we'll we'll put it uh, we'll make it publicly available if you need to or want to look at it, watch it again, share it with colleagues. Um, and uh, in the meantime, feel free to to follow us on LinkedIn um, and to check out our website uh, sdgtransformationcenter.org. Um, and yeah, so on that, um, thank you very much. Have a good e morning or evening, um, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye.